influence him with the life we live. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But for those times where we miss it and we, we don't get it right, our acceptance is not predicated on getting it right. Us being loved is not predicated on getting this right. Us being healed is not predicated on getting it right. It's not something we are earning through our good works. So it's nothing that we can miss out on or go without because of bad works. It's all because he loves us. That we can have hope for tomorrow. We can have hope for better. We can have hope of goodness because he loves us. Hallelujah. So we're just going to receive that love today. We're just going to take advantage of that unconditional love that he's bestowed upon us. So let's just pray for a moment. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I arrest every spirit of oppression Every work of depression, anxiety, fear, doubt, unbelief, I break the power of your influence now in the name of Jesus. I take the spirit of fear into custody. I arrest you in the name of Jesus. I bind every spirit of infirmity now in the name of Jesus. Every debilitating condition cease and desist in the name of Jesus. Every abnormality, abnormal growths, tumors, polyps be doomed in the name of Jesus. Digestive issues Be healed in the name of Jesus. All digestive issues, issues and troubles and complications with your digestion, be healed in the name of Jesus. Tumors be gone. I curse you at the root in the name of Jesus. Irregular heartbeats. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Heart issues, heart conditions, anything irregular about your heart and your blood flow, be healed now in the name of Jesus. I command your white blood count to be what it needs to be. Right now in the name of Jesus. Weaknesses, deficiencies, and our bones and our joints be healed in Jesus' name. Bone spurs be healed in the name of Jesus. Total eradication of the curse in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I loose healing to every fiber of your body, to every fiber of your being. I command you from the sole of your feet to the crown of your head, be healed in the name of Jesus. So be it. So be it. Lung conditions, be healed in the name of Jesus. Kidneys, I command you, function. Function properly. Function on the level that God created you to. In the name of Jesus. Now go ahead and receive that. Go ahead and mix faith with that. And believe you receive that. Believe it in the heart. Say it with the mouth. Hold on. Come down a little bit. Come down a little bit. No, you got to mix faith with it. You mix faith by believing it in your 
heart and confessing it as yours with the mouth. You need to take it. You need to make a demand on it. If it was something you could feel, check it. You're not checking to see if you got it. You're making a demand on it yes. to be what it needs to be. Bend it, stand on it, twist, shout if you got to run. But receive it. And it's just, it's just because he loves you. It's just because he loves you. All feelings, all, all sense of desertion and abandonment. God is healing your heart. He's healing your soul right now. In the name of Jesus. Restoring your soul. Restoring your joy. God's giving you your joy back. Which is your strength to live for him. Come on, you just need to speak to that sense of desertion and abandonment and resist it in the name of Jesus. And just take hold of the peace of God. Take hold of healing for your soul, for your emotions. Begin to declare and to decree, I have the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding keeps my heart and my mind. Keeps my heart and my mind through Christ which strengthens me. God did his part in loving us and giving us Jesus. He fixed it all. He gave us all when he gave us Jesus. Now listen, the rest is up to you. Listen to what I said. Because of the finished work of the cross, he provided a rest to the people of God. So he did his part. Now the rest is up to you. The rest that you need to enter into, the rest that you need to receive and possess, that's up to you to take. That's up to you to possess. It's been delivered. Now take delivery of it. Take ownership of God's rest for you. We got to learn to not take stuff back once we've given it to God. Yes. We cast it. We cast the care. We cast the issue. We cast it. And for a moment we have peace. But Satan is waiting in the wings. Yes, watching for what he considers an opportune time. To bring that problem back up, to bring that relationship back up, that mm. precious person, that yes. situation, just to see if we'll take back ownership. If we'll take back the ownership, if we'll take back the care of it. He's just after your joy because he knows your joy is your strength. But if he can't get your joy, whatever else he got, he got to give it back seven fold yeah. seven fold Hallelujah. seven fold and stop trying to regulate stop trying to regulate how it's going to come to pass stop trying to figure out what needs to happen in order for it to work for you just go straight to the end result. Yeah. Thank you. Don't listen. Don't worry about the details. Don't worry about the what ifs and the how abouts and the how come. No, go straight to the bottom line. And take it. Thank you, Lord. Declare it's done. Declare it as well. Anything else God needs from you, he'll tell you. Leave it in his hands. Leave them in his hands. 
Leave it in his hands. He's well able. He's faithful. Don't worry about trying to position yourself and advocate for yourself for the promotion. It doesn't come from man. It doesn't come through your toil. It doesn't come from the north, south, east, west. It comes from God. Just be faithful to serve him. Be faithful to live and walk out what you already know to be his will. Just set your heart, set your affection, your mind on what you know to be the will of God. Be steadfast and persistent with what you know to be the will of God. And wherever you're missing it, he'll correct you. He'll straighten you out. He'll let you know. But start with what you already know. Sometimes we're like, well, Lord, I just don't know what to do. No, that's a lie. We know what to do. We just don't know how to work out if we do it. All you need to know is the first step. Whatever steps you've taken, all you need to know is the next right step. You don't need to know step number three and four. Just the step that is before you. Rest. 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 In God's love for you. Judge him faithful to keep his word. And you'll be strengthened. You'll have the strength you need to be faithful to him. Just choose to rest. Just choose to rest. Just begin to declare it's well. It's all well. It's all good. I'm resting. I'm resting in the finished works. I'm resting. No, it don't look like it, it don't feel like it, but I got your word on it. So I'm resting. I'm resting that all is well. You got to let that come out your mouth. If a thought of fear, if a thought of doubt comes to your mind, cover your mouth. You haven't sinned with the thought. But do not give voice to a thought that doesn't line up with God's word. When we give voice to fearful thoughts, we are laying a track for the devil to ride in on into our lives. We are prophesying our own downfall. Put your hand over your mouth. Be deliberate, be intentional to take God's thoughts. How? By saying what he says about you. Say, listen, studies, even, even studies have shown you can know a person to be a liar. You can have experienced them telling you lies before. You can listen to them tell you a lie. And you know it's a lie. But if you keep hearing it, if you keep turning it over in your mind, if you keep dwelling on it, if you keep thinking it, you will begin to believe it. How much more, how much more can we enforce the will of God by saying what he says? Or you might not believe it here yet. You might have to start off, well, I'm doing it. I know the Bible says it, so I'm going to say it, but keep saying it. If you keep saying it, 
eventually you're going to believe it. It's going to drop from here to here. And then when it gets in here in abundance and come out your mouth, it's going to cause things to materialize, to manifest. You're going to bring forth the good things you've been speaking. That's what the Bible means about us being fruitful. It's not just about having a, a bunch of babies. It's about bring, bringing forth, being fruitful, bearing fruit, causing the goodness of God to be seen. Your high blood pressure is about the, it's, it's, it's about the cares you're carrying. You don't need healing. You just need to let go. Stop trying to figure it out. Either God is who he says he is, or he ain't. And you just need to decide one way or the other if he is or he's not. Either he is who the Bible says he is, or he's not. You choose. And if you choose, if you decide, God is who he says he is. Then stop worrying. Stop worrying. If you choose to believe he's a healer, receive your healing. If you choose to believe he is your provider, receive your supply. If he is your comforter, receive your comfort. Receive your peace. Receive your joy. Receive your everything. He is, I am that I am. Everything we need him to be. He is. He is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Listen to those words. I'm resting. Come on, prophesy that over your life. I'm resting. Woo! Glory to God. I'm resting, God. <laughs> I'm resting. I'm resting, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on. No more worry. No more pain. I'm resting. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the rest belonging to us. The 
We've just decided to enter in, God. We're resting in you. <laughs> and everything's all right. Everything's all right. Yes. All is well. All is well because you decide to agree with God. God you decided to enter into his rest. Thank you, so all is well. Thank you, all is well. It's all good. You just keep saying that. You keep prophesying that. You keep releasing that. And you're going to see that. You're going to see that in your life. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Thank you God. Jesus. Glory to God. Thank Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Man, how can you not love a God like this? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I thought maybe I would do this at the end of the service, but I'm just impressed of the Lord to do it now. So we're, we're going to go ahead and Just honor the Lord and worship him in terms of the baby dedications that we have today. And uh, just, get, just be prepared, those of you who are presenting your children today back to the Lord to when I ask you to just to come forth. And when I ask you to come forth, I, I want the, the mothers, the fathers, um, Grandparents, if you're here, godparents, if you're here, or, or whomever is dear and precious to you that uh, you would like standing with you. Uh, but I want to read, I want to read a couple of things to you. Uh, you have to bear with me, I'm... I got a Bible here today that I, it's not one I use often, so it's not as broken in as some of my other ones. So. Uh, so if you will, just, just go ahead and, and, and those of you who are coming, just go ahead and bring your children and your babies and just uh, stand here at the altar and I'm going to read a couple of passages of scripture to you. and. Uh, and we'll proceed. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to acknowledge that children are a gift from the Lord. Amen. And so, and even a greater thing to Return them back to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to read a couple of verses. The first one is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Just going to read just a, a, a couple of verses there. 
And this is, this is when Hannah had prayed and asked the Lord for a child. And she had promised the Lord to give him back to her. So having received her child, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I'm going to read it, verse 27. It says, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Glory to God. In, in, in nobody knows better than you and the Lord. Whatever the challenges have been, the opposition has been in terms of, of coming to this place. But God has shown you his faithfulness. Amen. Glory to God. Verse 28, therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. So just like Hannah presented her child to the Lord. So are we this day. Each of these babies, we're acknowledging they are a gift from God and we're giving them back to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, with regards to the parents and grandparents and godparents and all who may have um, a say, um, a vested interest in these children being all that God wants them to be. This is your charge from the Word of God. From Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so that's the responsibility that mothers and fathers have. That's the responsibility of those significant others in your lives whom you trust and rely on for counsel and as an example. Each of you who are standing here, you have some degree of responsibility for speaking into the lives of these children, for being an example to these children. Amen? Amen. Loving these children, admonishing these children, training them up to be who God called them to be. Being in prayer for them to get from God what his plans and purposes are so you can begin to mold them and, 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 and guide them and direct them in those areas. Amen? God will not withhold that from you. He wants to let you in on that. Amen? Because he wants your faith and authority to release him to do all that he wants to do. Amen? Amen. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we come now, Lord, in acknowledging this awesome, awesome occasion, Lord, this gift of God that you have given to these mothers and these fathers, Lord, and we are presenting them back to you. And we're positioning ourselves, we're posturing our hearts, Lord, to receive from you the wisdom and the grace to be mothers and fathers, to be all you need us to be to these children. And we commit them back to your care. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I separate them unto you even now as a baby. They're separated unto you and your kingdom purposes. We cancel out any and all plans of the enemy against them. We declare even now no weapon formed against them shall prosper. But they will go on to live out the plans and purpose that you have for them and be all you call them to be in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord that the plans and purposes you have for these children are plans of peace, Father, not evil, to prosper them, to increase them, to bless them, to work through them in expressing yourself, that they would come to know you at an early age and walk with you, that you would bless humanity even through them, God. And we thank you and we call it done. We bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Father, we give you praise and glory for what has transpired here. We thank you that there's a grace upon these parents and these loved ones to do their part. You are faithful to you yours. In Jesus' name, amen.
Glory to God. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. My bad, my bad. Got a certificate. Certificate. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's give God praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I'm, I'm just going, we're just going to worship in our giving and our tithes and offerings at the, at the end of the service after we have received the word. I believe with what God has for us today, your faith will be at a much stronger and higher point. For those who are taking advantage of the opportunity to give and worship, your faith will be at a higher point um, as we hear and receive the word. Uh, to be able to get the maximum yield and return that God promises. Amen. Hallelujah. So we'll, we'll do that at the, at the end. And uh, as, as many, as most of you know, I, I think you, you, you probably should know now. Uh, <clears throat> you, as a member of this church, as one who God has planted in this church, you know, you're, you're part of an apostolic ministry. You may or may not know that or understand that, but just know that it is. In, in, you know, um, missionaries, there's, there's one hand, there, I guess there's one form of missionary where believers may go into other places, locales, countries, or even places in, in this country to help um, build up, to help uh, with just things naturally that are needed to help make life better naturally. You may dig wells and help with a water supply, you may help with, with, with raising vegetables and food and things of this nature and so that that has uh its its place uh, and then there is the aspect of missionary work where you're literally going and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of god and and in and, and so uh tomorrow um as you know i'll be leaving for the philippines um along with uh chaplain downey i'm going with him and and uh a couple other people joining us there already there and, and so it'll be like an apostolic uh, team uh, meeting with pastors and church leaders to help establish government in order from the word, uh, ministering on Sundays, uh, Sunday mornings in, in various churches, and actually uh, a healing and faith conference uh, three days and three nights while we're there. And so if God has planted you here, you are a part of that. And so uh, again, I covet your prayers. There's a confession uh, available that I ask that you would just be faithful to give voice to and, and join your faith uh, with ours and one another for just the maximum flow of God's anointing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so uh, you, you, are, you are left in very capable hands as far as the ministry of the word is concerned, as you well know. And so I just ask you to just be mindful and, and uh uh, and, and supportive uh, in, in your prayers and your attendance. Um, and, and just open your heart and, and receive from God. Amen. Anybody that I am led to ask to stand in this place and speak, then, then I depend on God for whatever anointing or grace is necessary to be on that individual. And I expect you to open your heart up to them to receive from them uh, as, as though it was, it was me. Because ultimately, it's, we're all representatives of Jesus. And, and so if we're not preaching his gospel, we ain't preaching. Amen? And so I'm expecting, uh, I'm expecting God's faithfulness in the Philippines, and I'm expecting God's faithfulness here. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. And for all of you that are here today visiting, we thank God to have you here worshiping with us. Praise God. Couldn't couldn't have come at a better time. This is the best Sunday to come until the next Sunday. But you're here this Sunday, so this is the best one. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles today 
to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to use as a topic today the significance of seeing. S-E-E-I-N-G, seeing. The significance of seeing. Amen? Amen. And um, <clears throat> the world the world has a saying, and I'm sure you've heard it, seeing is believing, right? Anybody heard that? Seeing is believing. And usually you hear that, you know, especially in cases where you're being asked to believe something that maybe is, 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 it seems far-fetched, doesn't make any sense. So seeing is believing, right? Um, but in the kingdom, in the kingdom, believing is seeing. Amen? And so we, so, so, so there is significance in our seeing. Amen? We're, we're all seeing something. The question is, what is it based on? What is it governed by? Amen? And so the, the key for us or the, the, the goal or the objective for us is to see what God is saying. Amen? And so that's, that's what, I, what I hope to try to uh, uh, minister to you by the Spirit of God is the significance of, of seeing what God is saying. Because, God, because it, what, what God says in his word is not going to show up in our lives unless we can see it. Are you following me? So, so let, let's, let's just kind of get into it a little bit. Ephesians 2, are you there? All right, look at verse 11 with me. Uh, verse 11 reads, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So there was a time, right, as that we were Gentiles, meaning we were without God. There was once a time where we were without God in this world. We had no covenant, and therefore we had no hope, right? Verse 12 speaks about that. It says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Can you give me verse 12 in the Amplified Classic? Give me verse 12. Okay, so now look at this in the Amplified Classic. Uh, remember that you were at that time separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from all part in him. Amen? Amen. Utterly estranged and outlawed from the rights of Israel as a nation. So in other words, there are covenant rights and privileges that are available to all of us in Christ, but at the time when we were without Christ, we had to go without those rights and privileges. Are you following me? It says, we were strangers with no share in the sacred compacts of the messianic promise, with no knowledge or right in God's agreements, his covenants, and you had no hope, you had no promise. You were in the world without God. Let's just stick with the Amplified. Go to verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once, who were once were so far away, through or by or in the blood of Christ have been brought nigh. So, so we were speaking of a time when we were without. But now that you're in Christ, you're no longer without. You follow me? Through and by Christ Jesus, specifically your faith in the blood of Jesus, you have been brought nigh, right? You have been brought nigh. You got it? Now, now, thank you. This word nigh, the King James uses the word nigh. The Amplified says near. But faith in the blood of Jesus has brought us nigh, right? That word nigh means we now have access. We now have access. Your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ gives you access to all the rights and privileges 
that are available to believers, to the children of God, right? So, so in other words, if you, if you right now just think about one or two things off the top of your head that, that, you, that, that maybe two, one or two needs you can identify, right? Whatever that need is, whatever that issue is, I don't care what it is. Because of your faith in the blood of Jesus, you have access to the answer. You have access to whatever it is you need, not just, to, you know, not, not just in terms of your day-to-day, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there are things we need to live, right? We, we need food. We need clothing. We need shelter, right? We need a way of, of, of getting about to and fro. We, there are things that are basic needs that we all need. But even beyond that, your covenant with God gives you access to everything you need to fulfill your purpose. It gives you access to everything you need and or desire to live out a rich, fulfilling, rewarding life. Everything that's needful and or desirable to glorify God where your life is concerned, to satisfy every desire he's given to you, the the blood of Jesus, faith in the blood gives you access. So if it's not presently manifesting in our lives, it's not because we don't have access to it. It's because we have not yet taken delivery of it. Y'all ever heard that term, take delivery of something? That means to take delivery of means to actually receive, to possess and appropriate what's being provided. And so everything that we could ever need or desire that has to do with righteousness and godliness, that has to do with your everyday basic needs being met, and, and that has to do with you fulfilling your purpose, you have access to right? But if it's missing, it's because we have not yet taken delivery of it. And if it's missing, and to what extent it's missing, it's missing because we are not yet at a place where we can see what God is saying about it. Are y'all following what I'm saying? All right. So, so here's a statement I want to give you. I cannot Take delivery of what God has provided me beyond the level on which I can see it. I cannot take delivery of what God has provided me. He's given it to me already. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Right? If, if, you're, if, if you're a single woman and you want a husband, God, God has given you that. If you want a family, God has given you that. Right? If it pertains to righteousness and godliness, if it has anything to do with you f- fulfilling the plan and purpose of God for your life, he's already provided it. But I can't take delivery of it beyond the level on which I can see it. You follow what I'm saying? Now, now, now let, let's, let's, let's go back to that Ephesians uh, chapter 2. And let's, look, let's go back to the King James and, and let's look at verse 12 again. Let's start at verse 12. That at that time, so there was a time, but that's no more, right? At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus. Say, but now in Christ Jesus. See, if you're, if, because you're in Christ, you're not at the same place you were. You're not in the same state you were, so you shouldn't be living like you was. We shouldn't be going without like we were when we were without Christ. Now that we're in Christ, right, it says, Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, now we have access to everything needful and or desirable. Right? Go to verse 19 in the, in the, in the King James. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Let me look at that in the Amplified Classic just for a minute to see. Therefore, you are no longer outsiders. You're no longer exiled. You're no longer migrants. You're no longer aliens or excluded from the rights of citizens. You have citizenship, right? But you now share citizenship with the saints 
God's own people consecrated and set apart for himself and you belong to God's own household. Glory to God. Just, just hold that there for a moment and just kind of just kind of keep your eyes on that and feed on that for a second. You and I are in the household of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, you know when, when, when I go over to my, to my daddy's house, it's his house. Right? Clearly it's his house. But he my daddy. I'm his son. I act like it's my house. Because I'm welcome there. I got a right to be there. My last name gives me access. It gives me rights and privileges to everything he got. And I ain't do nothing to earn it or qualify for it. All I did was just be born. I go in there, I don't even have to knock. I know where the key is. I know the alarm code. I just go in there and do what I want, when I want, how I want. He ain't got to be there. Because I'm at home. That's my daddy. And you and I, each one of you that have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are part of the household of God. You need to learn to make yourself at home. You, you need to act like you know that God is your daddy. You have a covenant right, a citizenship right and privilege to everything God has. Not because you earned it, but all you did was get born again. Glory to God. Are you following me? So, so now think about, think about, now imagine God's house. Imagine God's house. You follow me? We, we trip out over gold and silver down here, but gold is pavement up there. There, there are no limits. There, there are no restrictions. There's no lack. There's no want for any good or beneficial thing. Matter of fact, he said this. He said, I prepared a table just for you to eat from right here in the earth, right in the midst of all your enemies. Are you following me? And so many of us as the children of God, the saints of God, so many of us, we act like we're scared to pull up a chair to the table. We're acting more like servants than we are sons. Like I got to wait for an invitation to the table. No. Man, I got a seat with my name on it at that table. I got a right. I got access to everything on that table. It's been prepared. Prepared ahead of time. There's healing on the table. There's health and peace on the table. There's good marriages and families on the table. There's a debt-free life of abundance on the table. And you can have all you want. You can eat all you can stand. It's on the table. But our problem is we can't yet see it. We, we can't see it. So because I can't see it, see, 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 let's say, let, I, 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 my wife and I have had the pl pl pleasure of, of being at Elder Marco's house for dinner before, and many of others, right? And they come in and they, you know, make yourself at home and all this kind of stuff. But in the back of your mind, you know that ain't your house. They might have a nice spread, but you're waiting for an invitation. You're waiting for the green light to go ahead and get, get to that table and eat. And then when you get there, you recognize, hey, some other folk got to eat. 
And you don't, you don't, just, you don't just act like a dog. But see, in daddy's house, ain't no restraints. You know, listen, listen, listen. Why I don't act like that in his house? Beyond the obvious reasons, it's not my house. But then imagine I go in and act like I act in my daddy's house. Shoes off, put my feet up, and just do whatever I want. Well, not, not El DeMarco, but somebody, somebody else, would. You, they, be, they talk about me. Man, you know what Pastor did. That joker had the nerve. You follow what I'm saying? But see, see, in your daddy's house, when you know you're loved, Come on. when you know God loves you, he ain't got nothing but good to say about you. He's already accepted you. He loves you unconditionally. You, you're not on a trial basis. You're not trying to try out. You're not already made to cut. Are you understand what I'm saying? So, so you can just be free. Are y'all following what I'm saying? But, but in order to take full delivery of everything he's provided, I've got to be able to see it in here. I got to be able to believe it in my heart that it really is so. You follow me? And so I cannot take delivery of it beyond the level on which I can see it. All right, all right. There's a debt-free life of abundance waiting on the table for all of us. Yeah. Oh, man. You know I love you, right? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor loves you. And he ain't fussing at you. He just wants you to have it. Okay, praise God. So, part of what keeps me from seeing what God said, now remember, remember in the kingdom, believing is seeing. If I believe what I heard him say, then I'll begin to see it in my heart. You follow me? But part of what keeps me from seeing it in my heart as being true, as being mine, is that I don't believe it. Why is it that I don't believe it? Because it don't make sense. And the world has conditioned me to try to make sense out of stuff. Well, the word is not about making sense. The word is about making faith. Now, ain't nobody in here knowingly, nobody would intentionally and knowingly say to God, I don't believe what you're saying. None of us would do that. We would, nobody would consciously and purposely say to God, I don't believe you. Right? But, but when God shows me something in the word, when, whether, whether, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I have a responsibility to God where your soul is concerned to feed you knowledge and understanding from God's word, right? I got a responsibility to feed you. You're the sheep. I've been chosen as the under shepherd. There's an anointing and a grace he's put on me to feed you. Knowledge and understanding from the word. Why? So that you will be fed, so that you be strengthened, so that you be nurtured, so that you be sufficiently edified and built up in, in, in truth and revelation and understanding and power to go out and live out the plan of God for your life. So that you can come, so that you be in a place in your faith to take delivery of everything God has provided for you. You follow me? Yes. Now, there are some things I can tell you that God is saying that you can't find it verbatim in the book. You can't go to a, you can't find this word for word in the book. God speaking, I have a debt-free life of abundance for every one of you. You cannot find that word for word verbatim in the, written in the book, can you? 
But if I, by the Spirit of God, pull out different scriptures and truths and, and, and by the Spirit of God minister to you, I can say to you that I see from the Spirit of God that his will for you is to live a debt-free life of abundance. You follow me? Now, the question is, what you going to do with it? Are you following what I'm saying? If, if, if mm. see, see, oh, glory to God. See, there, 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 there are things that, that, that God has ministered to me and showed me that, that I, I've had to repent over because I'm like, no, God, they ain't going to believe it. They're they going to look at me like some of y'all looking at me today. They ain't going to believe it. That is, that, no, no, no. And, and, and I hold off on it. Because in my mind, in my thinking, you ain't ready, you ain't going to believe it. But see, I've had to repent for that because that is not my call. If God is revealing it and tells me to minister to you, that's all I'm responsible to do is to minister it. I'm not responsible for what you do with it. Now, if, if, now I don't do that no more. So, so when, so, but when I, but, but, but when that would happen and I'd be like, nah, okay, do you realize I am fighting against God when I do that? I am resisting God. I am no earthly good to God when I do that and lean on my own understanding. You follow me? Because in my estimation, in my understanding, it didn't make sense. So I decided, no, we ain't going to do that. You follow me? Now, on the other hand, say the other hand. The other hand. I, we didn't dealt with me on one hand. Now, on the other hand, we're going to deal with you. Amen. Now, on the other hand, if I do get up here and tell you earnestly, passionately, with what I believe God has given me to tell you, and you don't receive it, because it don't make sense. Now you fighting with God. Uh, you, you, your problem is not with me. I'm just the delivery boy. I didn't come up with the message. I'm just sharing it. We can go a little step further. Even beyond what I might be measuring. As it pertains to the vision that God has given us. Given me to share with you for this house. And if you're planning here, you're part of the house. You're part of the vision. But if you don't agree with the vision, if you don't agree with, with what I'm sharing as I cast the vision, if you don't agree with the decisions I'm making concerning the implementation of the vision, if you got a problem with my decisions, you are fighting against God. I'm not your problem. Even if you don't say anything openly, Get all ugly and twist it up in the face. It don't take all that. You fighting against God. Why can't you receive it? Why can't you hear what I'm saying and receive it as God talking through me to you? Why can't you receive it? I tell you why. Glad you asked. Because you got a problem with God. Now, you won't acknowledge I got a problem with God, but you got a problem with God. And here's how you got a problem with God. First of all, you, got a pro you, you either got a problem with the word of God, which is God, because it ain't making sense. Amen. Or you got a problem with me as his representative. Amen. And if you got a problem with me because you ain't feeling it, you don't agree with it, you don't understand it, your problem with God. He sent me to tell you your problem ain't with me. So, so if you got a problem with it and can't receive it, you, 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 you got a problem with who you see me as being in your life. Now, listen, I'm not after, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to help us walk this thing out. In order to walk the thing out, it's got to be a, it, there's got to be order. God is a God of order. And he, and, and he has his way of doing things. You follow me? If he sent me to, and gave me as a gift to you as your pastor, as the under-shepherd to feed you with knowledge and understanding, 
then he intends to use me to get to you what you need to walk out his will for your life. And if you got a problem with me, you can't receive. You can, he, you can audibly hear the words I'm saying, but you won't have the anointing that accompanies it because you're offended at me. And I'm not, listen, listen, I have no, well, I do have an idea, but what I was about to say, I don't, I'm not saying this and preaching this message today because I'm thinking of any person or particular situation where that's happened. I'm just trying to be yielded to the Spirit of God. You follow what I'm saying? So I don't have any person or situation in mind as I'm teaching you this. You follow me? Um, I'm not teaching it out of, out of uh, that's not motivating the, the, the teaching. You follow me? So, 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 you can only receive of the anointing that's on me for you to the degree that you can receive me as being sent from God. You can only take delivery of what God has provided you to the degree that you can see it as being yours. You can't receive me as the one God sent to tell it to you. You can't receive it as yours. Y'all see how it works? Now look at your neighbor and say, I told you, Pastor, love you. Now, look at Genesis 13. Look at Genesis 13. Now, understand, I got to take, I got to be able to see what God is saying. See it in my heart as being mine in order to take delivery of it, right? Genesis 13 and, and let's just look at how significant our seeing is. I'm going to start at verse, I'm going to start reading at verse 14. But, just, but you know what's going on here. This is after uh, Abram and Lot and, and had come back from Egypt. And, and the Bible says uh, here that, that, that their, what they had, their possessions was so great that the land couldn't hold them. And so there was beginning to be strife between Lot's herdsmen and Abram's herdsmen. And now, now listen to this. Think about this now. Abram goes to Lot and says, look, man, I'm paraphrasing. He said, look, we family. We blood. You know, you my favorite nephew. I, took, I let you come with me when God said, don't take nobody. And he said, now, your, pe your people that you got working for you, is in, they beefing with my people. They in strife, and there ought not be any strife between them, and there ain't going to be no strife between us. Therefore, so that there be no strife between us, you look to the north, south, east, west, you pick out what you want, and you, you choose whatever you want, whatever's going to work for you, you go that way, I go the other way. Now, what's motivating Abram saying this? That there be no strife. Now, notice... Everything Lot got, he got because Abraham got so much, it's overflowing to him. So, so, so technically, Lot should have said, no, um, you the man, the blessings on you. I'm just grateful to be here. You pick, and I'll go the other way. That's what he should have done. But he looked at the place where it was well watered, where it looked good, and he said, okay, I'll go there. Now, how is it that Abram was able to let Lot choose the best without being worried about missing out? Because he could see what God was saying. He could see, based on the covenant promises, that it didn't matter where he went, because this blessing was on him, he was going to be good wherever direction he went. So rather than seek after his own agenda, he was seeking first the kingdom agenda that there be no strife. And just like God promised, he adds all things to us. Look right here in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated, here come the addition of all things, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. 
For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. What is he saying when he says, arise and walk through the land? He is saying, get up and take delivery of what I provided you. The word walk in scripture is oftentimes used to talk about our life, our lifestyle, the way we go about living and conducting our affairs. And it, and it carries a connotation of spiritual maturity. So, 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 so God is saying to us by the spirit, arise. He's saying, rise up, O kill. And walk with me in a greater level of spiritual maturity. Arise from where you are under present conditions and circumstances and walk with me where I called you to be. Take full delivery of everything I provided you. Are you following what I'm saying? Now notice, God didn't say anything to Abram about what he could see until after he had separated from Lot. And notice this, God didn't tell him to separate from Lot. He decided out of honor and reverence for God to separate from Lot. That, that's, 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 an ex, that's an example of seeking first the kingdom. Are you seeing what I'm saying? But it was now, now all that land was still there to begin with before he separated from Lot, right? Right? But he, but, but he, didn't, he didn't tell him to take delivery over it until after Lot had separated, until after he had separated himself from Lot. Why? Because before then, Abram wouldn't have been able to see it. See, the word, so, so the word lot, the name lot, it means veil, like B-E-I-L, like a veil over your face. It means veil, it means covering, like a veil covers your face. So as long as lot was present, his presence served as a veil and a covering. His presence, his allegiance, his association served as an obstruction to Abraham's view, to his vision. It hindered his ability to see. And see, there are things that are yet hindering our ability to see what God is saying. There are things hindering our ability to believe and trust what God is saying. There are things hindering our ability to apply our faith in what God is saying. There, are, there is that which is obstructing our view and our ability to see. It's called unbelief. It's called, unbelief is at the root of it. Are you following me? And so we have got to do our part to remove the obstructions, to become separated from whatever's obstructing us. Now notice, what it was Lot's presence that was obstructing his view, right? Abram allowed Lot to go with him when God said, leave everybody. Here's what's obstructing our ability to see. Us leaning to our own understanding as opposed to trusting God is obstructing our ability to see. Us doing what we think we need to do to make sure we're going to be straight as opposed to trusting God and just giving ourselves completely to his service is obstructing our ability to see. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Not yet fully releasing and turning everything over to God is obstructing our ability to see. See, we're still trying to hold on to a level of wisdom presented by fallen man trying to overcome evil caused by the one that's the source of the wisdom we use it. Y'all get that? I'm, I'm trying to, if I'm trying to 
go through life and navigate the challenges and the adversities and the trials and tribulations of life leaning on my own understanding or trusting in the human conventional wisdom of man and the systems and institutions that this world order has provided instead of God in what he's saying then the fact that I'm, then, then in that I'm, I'm still carrying the care and the weight and the burden of my own welfare. And that's hindering my faith from working because it's hindering me from seeing what I already have. I'm still trying to make sure I can meet my needs and be all right rather than trusting in God to do it for me. And to that end, I'm hindering my ability to see what he's already done. Are you following me? So listen, people. At some point, we, gotta, we just, we just got to get, get over that hump to the point, I trust God. Listen, listen, I, I, I'll tell you where I'm at. I, I'm, I'm at, at the point now where I'm, 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 I'm going to do my utmost to trust God. Why? Because... That's where my confidence is. It's not about trying to be spiritual. It's just that that's where my confidence is. If I had confidence in this, that, or the third, I, 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 I would lean on it and go with it. But, but I don't have no confidence in that. My confidence is in this covenant God established. Yeah. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So, so it, you, you got to come to the place, okay, Lord, this is what I believe you said, so this is what I'm going to do to follow you. And if I'm missing it in any way, I expect you to correct me and help me get on the right track. But absent of that, as best I'm able to discern, this is what I believe you're saying, so this is what I'm going to do. You follow me? Amen. Now, as long as I know I'm sincere and genuine in my heart with that decision, I can trust God to correct me if I've missed it in any way, to come through for me, his grace to cover me, him to straighten me out. I can trust him that it's going to be all right. Amen. You follow me? But here's the other thing. Ah. Uh. Sometimes God will tell you something, let you in on something, bring you up, correct you, bring you up to a place of, of, of more insight and understanding. See, what is he doing? He's stretching you. He's stretching your faith. See, we get accustomed to trusting God for the rent money. We get accustomed to trusting God for the mortgage payment. But God's trying to stretch our faith to trust him for the final payment for the thing to be paid off. We, we trust him. We trust him, Lord. We, 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 we go to the car dealership. Lord, I sure hope the credit score come back high enough. And praise God, he meet us where we are. But he's trying to stretch us out to where he wants us to be. To where we can go in there without having to need a credit score. See, he's trying to stretch us. And see, see, he says some things to me like that, and I'm like, oh, man, God, I don't know. And this is my this is my argument. This is my argument with the Lord. Lord, I I I don't know if I I know you're gonna do your part, but I don't know if I can keep up and do my part. And so I talk myself out of even trying because I. I, I reasoned out that I can't do what he's asking me, so in, so in the process, I'm going to drop the ball along the way somewhere. Don't you think God knew that when he told me? Don't you think he knows our, our strengths and weaknesses, our tendencies? He know all about us, right? He know we're going to mess up before he, he speak to us and instruct us? Because he's not... He's not, trying to, he's not trying to get us to follow and do what he's calling us to do in ourselves and our own ability. Man, if I go as far as I know how to go, 
and that ain't enough, that's where his ability to kick in. He's the difference maker. Yeah. So I'd rather endeavor to trust God. Me personally, you do you. But me personally, I'd rather endeavor to trust God and come up a little short than not try at all. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know if I keep at it, if I keep at it, the day is going to come when I cross that threshold, when I get that breakthrough, and bam, it's going to be on. Are you following what I'm saying? See, do you remember how difficult and, and, and troublesome it was to believe God on one level that you're no longer on? You've surpassed that level. You're on a higher level. And you look back and like, man, I can't believe that I was so worried. Why? Because you're, listen, you see God for who he is in a greater way than what you could see then. You can see what he's saying in a greater depth and a greater degree of understanding and light and revelation. So you see how easy it was for him to do that. But now he done brought us to a higher place and he's trying to take us still to a higher place, but we are having trouble going because I can't see what he's saying, right? Now he told Abram, as far as you can see, I've given it to you. And that's the same way with God. God. Listen, God has given us further than we can see. But I can't take delivery of it beyond what I can see. So, so, so you, you follow me? And see, I cannot go where I cannot see. I think I got a statement like that. I cannot go where I cannot see. I can't, I can't go to a place of walking in divine health if I can't see myself walking in divine health. I can't go to a place of a debt-free life of abundance if I can't see myself as being debt-free, having abundance. Are you following what I'm saying? I cannot go to a place of, of, of paying off your house I can't see myself as being able to pay off your house. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I remember one time I was in the grocery store and, uh, and, and the Lord impressed upon me to, to pay, for, pay for this lady's groceries. I just saw the lady when, when I got that impression. But before I said, yeah, you know what I did? I checked out her cart. To see, to see, to see if it looked like I had enough to do it. Or if it was going to be a little, little tight. You follow me? But God's trying to get us to the place where when you hear it, when you hear what he say, it's an automatic response. Yes, sir. I got you. You don't even, you ain't even worry about the, about, about the cart, what's in the cart. You follow me? Why? Because, listen, it ain't about my ability. Whatever I got, he provided it. I'm just being a steward over it, as he says. When he make it flow to me, I let it flow through me to go where he wants it to go. And then he promised to multiply it and get it back to me. And thus, I am enriched in all bountifulness. When, you, when we let God tell us what to do with what he gave us and actually obey it, he multiplies it and gives it back to us more and more. But I am not, I'm not going to let go of what he gave me if I can't see what he's saying about giving it back to me. Are y'all following me? I cannot go in God, with God, where I cannot see. You follow me? I got to be able to see what he's saying. So, so that, that's, that's true. Even, even with Jesus, Jesus had to be able to see what the Lord was saying in order to, to finish his course. You follow me? Look at, look, at Mark, uh, look at Mark chapter 10, verse 33 and, and 34. Just trying to make sure. Yeah, look at that. Now, See, 
it starts off saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. Verse 34. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus had to be able to see that, to do that. He could not go there without seeing it. Are you following me? Even Jesus, in walking out the plan and purposes of God, he could only go where he could see. Through the word of God, he could see that after three days, he was getting back up. And he could give his life knowing he was going to get it back. Hebrew says he endured. All that he endured, why? Because he could see the joy that was set before him. He could see the end. He could see what God was saying. We're talking about Abram. Abram gave up his only begotten, well, his, not his only begotten, but his only begotten by Sarah. He gave up his son, the one God promised he would have through Sarah. He gave him up to the Lord because he could see him being raised back up in a figure. Look at, look at Hebrews 11, I think verse 17, somewhere around in there, whatever it is, I, I share it with you. Um, you know, when you watch the TV shows about uh, Abraham and all that kind of stuff, and, and you know, where God says, you know, g g give me your son, offer up your son, get up, I'm gonna, I want you to go to a, to a, a, a mountain, I'm going to tell you, and, and there I want you to offer up your only begotten son. You know, TV shows show, show Abraham agonizing and all agon No, no, it won't none of that. The Bible says early the next day he got up. He's like, that's what you want? Bet. Let's go, God. Right? By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received, had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, next verse, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, next verse, accounting, accounting, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. What does that mean? That means he saw it already done. He went up the mountaintop fully intended to put that knife in his son because he had already saw him raised up from the dead. So in his heart, it was already done. He was already back from the dead before he put the knife in him. You understand what I'm saying? And the fact that he was willing to offer up his son gave God the right to offer up his son. The place where he offered up his son was the same place that, that God offered up Jesus, same place he was on that cross. See, God, can't, God doesn't have the authority to just get involved in stuff in the earth apart from those having authority in the earth giving him the green light with our faith, our faithfulness, our obedience. God has the ability to do whatever needs to be done, but we have to authorize him. He don't have the authority. So Abram's obedience to give up his son authorized or gave God the legal grounds to give up his son. Are you following me? Amen. But the point is, both God and Abram, Abraham saw their sons raised back up. Yeah. See, when we can see, when we see what God is saying, what he's promising concerning our giving, we can freely let it go. Because just because it leaves your hand, it don't leave your life. It leaves your hand it dies and falls to the ground, meaning you cease to trust and depend on it. It falls to the ground, and because it dies, it bears fruit. It produces more. But as long as it's staying in my pocket and ain't in the ground, it's as big as it's ever going to be. 
If you got a need, I'm telling you by, by all the, 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 the authority of that book right there, your way out is sowing a seed. I mean, you know, I tell you what, just keep watching. I'm going to I'm I'm prove everything I'm telling you. Just keep watching. Just keep watching. So I, listen, man, I, I'm, I'm tired of playing around. I'm tired of messing around. I, I, uh, no, I, you just, just keep watching. Just keep watching. You follow me? Now let me see if I had, okay, yeah, I'll tell you that. All right, all right. Now let, let's let's get to this and, and let's let's deal with this. So 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 so, I tell you what. Pull up pull up for me Matthew uh, six, nineteen and twenty. I I touched on this last Sunday I believe in in in, in the Sunday before that or Wednesday before that. Uh, I I shared with you several several Saturdays ago laying right here in the floor on a Saturday. The Lord ministered to me, got up and wrote down that, that he was calling me, mandating to lead this body into a debt-free life, debt-free living, a life of abundance, right? From covetousness to covenant, right? Now, I, th now, I said that by the Spirit of God. Because I, in and of myself, I can't do that. And there are so many questions that Satan will hit your mind with that if I stopped to entertain it, I wouldn't get up here and share that. You follow me? So when I heard it, I had to decide what to do with it. To mix faith with it and receive it and act on it? Or not? And so much you. Now what you did with that, is going to determine if you walk in that. How much regard you have for me and the words coming out of my mouth have everything to do with if you're going to be able to see that. Some of y'all ain't thought no more about it since then. I ain't no condemnation. I'm just tell you what it is. But just repent, man. Get over it. Get back on track. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It didn't say don't lay up for yourself, just don't do it in the earth because in the earth is subject to the evil of this world. It's not saying don't have a savings account, stuff like that. It's saying don't put your trust and confidence in what you can amass in the earth because whatever you can get your hands on in the earth is subject to the evil that's present in the earth. He's saying, rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. I'm telling you, we have a heavenly banking system, a banking account, a heavenly banking account that we can make deposits in and make withdrawals from. Amen. Now, you, 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 I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Now, what that verse does not say is lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven and you can't touch it till you get there. Didn't say that, but many of us read that in there or conclude that. That's, that's that lying devil. Go to 1 Timothy, please, chapter 5, verse 17, and just look at it in the Amplified. 1 Timothy 5, 17 in the Amplified Classic. I'm going to tell you, it's, it, you, you, you lay it up for yourselves in heaven to be able to use and benefit from in the earth. You follow me? Look at this. Um, no, I'm sorry. Verse, uh, chapter 6. My bad. That's my mistake. 1 Timothy chapter 6. That's a good one to look at too, though. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at 1 <laughs> Timothy chapter 6. As for the rich in this world, say, that's me. That's me. Charge them not to be proud and arrogant, and contemptuous of others, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches. In other words, don't put your trust in the uncertainty of riches. They're not a certain thing. They're not a sure thing. If it's in the earth, Satan can get at it. He can affect it through recessions, oppressions, depression, all that. You follow me? 
He says, charge them not to be proud and arrogant, contemptuous of others, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God, who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything, provides us with everything, provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Look at verse 18. Charge them to do good, to be rich in good works. Talking about us now. Yeah. To be liberal and generous of heart, ready to share with others. Right? Next verse, please. In this way, laying up for themselves the riches that endure forever as a good foundation for the future, so that they may grasp, I think the King James says, lay hold of that which is life indeed. King James says, lay hold of eternal life. This says, so that you may grasp that which is life indeed. Now tell me this, you don't need to lay hold of eternal life in heaven. Eternal life doesn't begin when you get to heaven. Eternal life begins when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But to lay hold of it, to grasp it means to take delivery of it. So when you give, when you sow, when you yield to God and be a blessing in some capacity, tithes, offerings, whatever other sowing you do, your giving is laying up for you a treasure in heaven against, the, against as a good foundation for the future so that you can grasp it at the time you need it. Now let me prove that to you. Go to Philippians 4, please, chapter, uh, verse 15. Philippians 4, 15. And, the, and let's look at it at King James first. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Next verse. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Next verse. Not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now go back to 15 in the Amplified Classic. Verse 15, yes. Now look at this. Now you Philippians yourselves well know that in the early days of the gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church assembly entered into partnership with me and opened up a debit and credit account in giving and receiving except you only. So he's talking to a church that partnered with him and helped him to take the gospel of the kingdom to places where it had not been established. So their part was to pray for him and to contribute to his life and necessities and, and with contributions. So, there was, so he's saying here, it's a debit and credit account. It's giving and receiving. That's partnership. You follow me? Nobody did it except you only. Next verse 16, Amplified Classic. For even in Thessalonica, you sent me contributions for my needs, not only once, but a second time. Verse 17. Not that I seek or am eager for your gift. But I do seek, and I am eager for the fruit which increases to your credit the harvest of blessing that is accumulating to your account. Every time we give, every time we sow, you're laying up in store for yourselves treasures. You're laying it up in a heavenly account that the evil of this world can't, can't, can't access, can't sabotage. That's where my trust is. So, so I believe this. I believe this. Now, I can't, well, I, 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 with enough time I could, but I, I don't have time for today. But I believe this wholeheartedly. Whenever you give your, your, or sow in any capacity, you're laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And God looks at your seed. He looks at your gift. And he credits your account. And in that, what he does is, see, see, everything you need is already in the earth, right? All the gold, the silver, the money, resources, properties, that's already in the earth, right? All the precious minerals for cars and how, it's already in the earth, right? 
Well, when you give, God credits your account and designates certain portions of what's in the earth as yours. Certain portions of, the, of what you need that's already in the earth, he designates as belonging to you per your giving. Are you following what I'm saying? I believe that, man. And so at the, appro at the appropriate time when you need it, you can place a demand on it and call for it. God had me laying up in store for myself treasures that I had no idea was for me. Never crossed my mind. Back when I'm 14, 15 years ago, had me cutting the grass at the house that I now live at now. I tread all over the yard. He said, everywhere the soles of your feet tread, I'm going to give it to you. We were living in Richmond when it became time where we knew it was time to move back here. Had no, we had a house and didn't have nowhere to live in here. God set it up where we began leasing the home where we were living. Then he set it up where we could purchase it, the, guy, the owner finance it, and then brought in all the money that the guy required. The, 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 the value of praise, whatever the praise for, the guy said, I'll sell it to you at, at 20000 less than what it appraised. Uh, he said, but I just want a 20000 deposit. And, and, and it was not in my earthly account. But I had it on deposit. And God got it in hand without no toil without no sorrow, without asking nobody for it, without borrowing for it. You know how I got it to us? The same way I'm going to teach you how you can get it to you. This, this book, if you don't have this book, this would be a good investment. This is a book called The Laws of Prosperity by Kenneth Copeland. Y'all ever heard of, of Bishop David Oedipo out of Africa? Years and years ago, he took this book, he took a book written by Gloria Copeland called God's Will for You as Prosperity, and a jug of water, and his Bible, and spent three days praying and fasting and reading these books. And at the end of three days, he had a revelation that he was rich and he'd never borrow another dime in his life. And that man has got to have the biggest ministry that I know of in the earth all debt free. It would amaze you to start telling you the stuff that they have accomplished through laws of sowing and reaping. It, it would amaze you. It would amaze. I'm, I mean, you're talking about ha building a 55,000 seat auditorium debt free and got the nerve. I ain't say 5,500. 55,000. Man, that's more people that's in Henry County. And got three services a Sunday. Then God had nerve enough to tell him to build an overflow room. And he put up two additional tents that are now uh, uh, permanent structures, I believe. And, and, and the first day they was open, they was filled. He invited Kenneth Copeland to come and preach there. Kenneth Copeland went and saw it, and, and his wife saw it. And his wife said, the, the student then outstripped the teacher. Anyway, I, 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 I'm just telling you it's a good resource, and I'm going to read to you. Um, I, I, I'm just going to read to you some steps that, that you can take. You ain't got to do none of this between you and the Lord. But if you if you receive it, you can change your life. And and I'm going to read some steps to you that that we've acted on, and and we are again acting on placing a demand on some things. Uh, and it's exciting, man. And then I'm going to read you a sample prayer, a sample prayer, a sample confession that, that you can do. Okay, so there, there are basically six steps. See, here's the thing. We've been conditioned by the world system to, to think that who we work for determines our income. And they don't. They may set the salary. They may determine how much they're willing to pay you but they don't determine how much money can come in to your house. You follow me? 
And so God, that, that's why, see, that was the whole purpose for, for the blessing that was on Abraham's life. We do know enough about Abraham to know that the blessing made him rich, right? Okay, you ever read where Abraham worked for somebody? He had a job, had a 401k, he took out a loan. No, he worked for God. He served God's purposes. And all things was added. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, not our toil, not how hard we can go to that job and punch the clock. Now, we should go to the job. I'm not saying you're not supposed to work, but the motive shouldn't be to earn a living. The motive should be to earn a giving. The motive should be to glorify God and resolve the problems you're there to address. But you don't depend on that salary to live. You depend on the blessing to produce for you to live. Yeah, yeah. So you can set and determine how much comes into your house regardless of your job. That's why if God tell you to work at Burger King, you can work at Burger King and covenant with God and, and prosper beyond any, anybody's business. Why? Because of the blessing. Yeah. It ain't about the salary. Yeah. You follow me? Mm -hmm. All right, so, so, so here it is. Step one. For you and your, your, your spouse, the two of you need to get together and decide on the amount you need for your household. Not just to, yes, to pay the bills, to cover the expenses and all of that, but you should include money enough to pay extra on stuff to pay it off. You should include money for miscellaneous stuff, unexpected things. You should include money uh, for, for sewing. You should include... You should include uh, um, you, should, you should include money enough to, to live and enjoy a good, rich quality of life. Decide on the amount that, 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 that it takes for your household. You follow me? And, and, and so here in the book, it talks about being single-minded. That's also in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, it, it talks about being single-minded because in James 1, Verses 7 and 8, it tells us a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, right? So decide on the amount prayerfully, decide on the amount, right? That's step one. Step two, get in agreement. Spouses, get in agreement. If you're a single uh, uh, mother, father, parent, whatever, you don't have a spouse, find another mature believer to get in agreement with you. According to Matthew 18 and 19. Pull up Matthew 18 and 19 in the Amplified Classic, please. Now, this, this works not just on money. This works on anything that God has, anything that you are receiving from the Lord. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together, that means you're believing the same thing and saying the same thing. Right? If two of you will agree on, 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 on to, about whatever, anything and everything you may ask, anything and everything you may ask, anything and everything you may ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by my Father in heaven. So determine the amount, and then you and your spouse agree in prayer with God's word and one another, and it shall be done and come to pass. Glory to God. Now, now, I hope you're writing it down. Step three, after you decided the amount, after you agreed in prayer, lay hold on it by faith. Mark 11, 23 and 24, those principles, whatever you speak, whatever you say, believing in your heart and not doubting, but it'll come to pass, you'll have it. And you'll have what you pray when you pray, believing in your heart that it's granted you when you pray, you'll have it. Right? Didn't say believe you would receive and God will do it. It says believe you would receive and, and, and you will have it. Right? Believe you take ownership and possession of it at the time you're praying and it'll be yours. It'll come to pass. Right? Decide on the amount. Agree according to Matthew 18 and 19. Lay hold on it by faith according to Mark 11, 23 and 24. And start believing it in your heart and confessing it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. That you got it, that is done. Right? Got it? Number four, very important number four. This is a big responsibility that we have. Bind the devil and his forces in the name of Jesus. Bind the devil and his forces in the name of Jesus. 
the forces that would come against you, that would come against your finances, your prosperity, bind the devil and his forces in the name of Jesus. You have the authority in Jesus' name to order Satan out of your financial affairs. Particularly in the case of husband and wife, husbands and fathers, as, as the spiritual head of the home, need to be on that. Got it? Number five, loose the forces of heaven. Hebrews 1 and 14, Hebrews 1 and 14 refers to the angels as ministering spirits. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us who are heirs of salvation. They don't minister to us, they minister for us, right? How? As you give voice to God's word, right, their job is to hearken to that and bring it to pass, right? So you loose the forces of heaven. You loose the ministering spirits to go and bring about what you're giving voice to. You got that? Amen. Number six, begin to praise God for the answer. Praise keeps the door of abundance wide open. Praise keeps the door of abundance wide open. Because see, when you're praising God, that's one of the highest expressions of your faith. You're giving God praise and thanksgiving for something you can't see yet in the natural. But because you can see what he's saying, you see that you got it and you give him praise and thanksgiving. Now, here's a, a sample prayer or confession you can, you can make. and You put it in words that minister to you, given by the Spirit of God, but this is just an example. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for X amount of dollars. We have this money in our heavenly account, and we are withdrawing this amount now. We believe we've received X amount of dollars in Jesus' name. As in Mark 11, 23, excuse me, as in Mark 11, 23 through 24, we believe it in our hearts and confess it now that it's ours in the name of Jesus. We agree that we have X amount of dollars according to Matthew 18 and 19. From this day forward, we roll the care of this over on you and thank you for it. Satan, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over you. We bind your operation now and render you helpless. Ministry spirits, we charge you to go forth and cause this amount to come to us according to Hebrews 1 and 14. Father, we praise your name for meeting our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus and for multiplying our seed for sowing in the name of Jesus. That's just an, an example of a prayer and a confession based on what I just said. Now, how do you see what God is saying? Joshua 1 and 8. Put that up there for me, uh, please, and, and, and I'll, I'll end on that. Joshua 1 and 8. How do you see what God is saying by meditating on his word? This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe, that means see, to do according to all that is written therein, for then, as you see how to act on it, then thou will make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. And so the statement that goes, I think I got a statement that, yeah, do I have a statement about meditating? That's right, okay. Oh, put that one up first. Put that, up. that was a good one. I forgot about that one. Believers who live according to their senses live without the benefit of the blessing. Next one, that next one about meditating. Meditation of God's word enables us to see what he is saying. You got it? Meditation on God's word enables us to see what he is saying. And we can only take delivery of what he's provided on the level that we can see it. So you and I are the ones that determine how deep we can see and how far we can go. Amen? So, Father, I thank you and I praise you for the ministry of your word today. I thank you for the unfolding of your word today. I thank you, Lord, for edifying us and refreshing us today with your spirit and your might. And it is our, it is our joy, Lord. It is our desire, our delight, our privilege to sow into the kingdom of God. We understand that through sowing and reaping, Lord, we engage a law that helps us to perpetuate our own prosperity, our own increase, our own success, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow into the kingdom. 
Lord, what we have, what we possess, you gave it to us. And so of your own, we give back to you in tithes and in offerings. And with great joy and great delight, we sow today. And we also release our faith that even as we sow, we also reap. It is given unto us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over today and every day forward. We thank you, we count it done, and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may receive the tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. How awesome it is to serve the Lord, the Most High God. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless your people. Every household here and represented, I speak favor and increase upon every person in Jesus' name. I commit each of us afresh and anew to your care and to your charge to watch over us and keep us safe while we're absent one from another until we meet again. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah.